Okay, it's um, it's Monday afternoon. It's, it's in fact it's Tuesday afternoon here on uh, ourgame.ie live. I'm joined by Fintan O'Toole, and for some reason or other, Michael Verney's screen has gone a little bit odd there. No more so than the man himself. But we'll just start off with uh, Fintan O'Toole. Fintan, how are you doing on this Tuesday morning? All good, Shane. Yourself? I'm ah, sure I'm not too bad. Trying to keep the good side out. Um, one of the first things that kind of struck me over the weekend is, of course, Michael or sorry, Leo Varadkar was on. Um, was on TV talking about GEA being partial contact and maybe that'll be back sooner rather than later. The GEA is as partial contact, uh, you wouldn't, <laughs> that's a tough one to get your head around. Yeah, I think it was in the, the sport and world map that uh, came out Friday. Um, the biggest thing was probably the contrasts uh, in the, the definition between rugby and GEA uh, when you think of you know, like a, a rock and hurling has been kind of become very popular over the last what, last couple of years. Like, how is that any different in terms of the kind of the contact and the kind of risk for players um, as a passage of play in, in rugby would be, and the same for Gaelic football. So, I mean, look, I suppose to be fair, that anyone can try and do a roadmap and try to, I suppose, figure out when sports are going to make a comeback. It's quite difficult at this this time to make any kind of clear and fast rules and to be very very exact about it. And there has to be a bit of flexibility, but. Definitely, like you know, I, I, I have some doubts over whether um, people it will be able to kind of achieve the timeline that they kind of uh, have sketched out uh, on Friday, and then subsequently in the interview he gave on the Late Late Show, when you know I think the talk he made about the All Ireland Finals probably was a bit of a throwaway comment, you know. Mm. I'd say the GA were kind of caught a bit off guard. Um, I mean, I know, say the Junior and Intermediate All Ireland Club Finals, they take place with very little fans there, um, but in general, an All Ireland Final. The, the crowd, the atmosphere, the, the, the noise, the colour, like, they're as essential really, are they, aren't they, to the whole experience and the occasion as to what goes on in the pitch. Michael, what do you think? Is uh, our GEA, the two codes, are they considered, uh, would you agree with the idea of them being partial contact? But Jesus, people like me and you saying that being on top of someone uh, pulling and dragging as like, contact as you can get and get contact. What is as you can get. It was funny. There was, there was a lot of, kind of strange things happened um, over over between Friday and Saturday. Even like Leo's comment about the All Ireland was such a throwaway remark, remark. Like and like if he's in any way tuned into what's going on, he knows that, that there's no way that that's a possibility really for an All Ireland final to be taking place in all, in August or September, as he said. And, like I know, like the GA aren't the only ones that were probably taken aback. I do a bit in racing as well. So he's basically, uh, from his comments the other day, racing won't start back until June 29th at the moment, which is totally um, uh, out of sync with the discussions that they've been having. And they were hoping to start up again behind closed doors on, on uh, May 18th. So it's a bit all over the place. I just still find it very hard to believe how we're going to see much action this this side of probably August, I would say, being honest with you, the, a lot will change over the coming months. But this side of August, and I and imagine as we've talked before, that the club will be coming back strong probably for about eight to ten weeks in that period. But um, yeah, it's, <laughs> they're as contactful as you uh, can get. Michael, your your video feed is a little bit jumpy, but look, we're going to persevere anyway. We've a couple of topics to go through today. Um, one of them is the impact of COVID on um, players who are looking at the idea of possibly retiring, whether it encourages them to do it more so or reconsider that things that no longer exist in the GEA and we're also going to look at who would win a winter uh, football all Ireland so uh, we'll just start off with yourself Fintan there uh, also we're going to do a who am I section actually before we go too much further Michael do you want to introduce that idea the uh, the who am I you're going to give the first clue yeah no we're just saying we do something yeah no we're just saying we do something people that listen that listen the whole hour so the we're whole hour, so we're going to give four different clips uh, throughout the, the hour. First uh, the, the, the first clip will be the hardest clip. Next clip will get gradually easier, gradually easier, and then the last clip will be the easiest clip the four. Now, how easy it actually is, I'm, I'm not so certain. It's a kind of a GA legend or some sort of kind of within the GA. Uh, so my first clue, um, you and Finton don't actually know who it is, so I'll be interested to see what, what your take up is or who you think is. But the first clue is, I have one All Ireland Senior Football Championship medal to my name in what is my county's only Sam Maguire triumph. For that, so that's the first clue. I have one All Ireland Senior Football Championship medal to my name in what is my county's only Sam Maguire triumph. So the clues will get easier. We'll have another one, maybe another ten or fifteen minutes. Anyone jumping out to you with that? Derry is the county that's jumping out anyway. Um, that after that, so I get the other Ulster sides around there. Down Donegal, what about the second? 
Um, yeah, we won't, we won't get any further. We'll wait for the second clue. Okay. Well, let's let's move into this topic then about players and and uh, COVID nineteen and how. Some players might have considered retirement before, but now they're getting a taster of what it's like and they might be reconsidering. Whereas, you know, there are some players who are a little bit older and we're not 100% sure what time or when anyone is going to get back playing. So this might effectively retire them, Fintan. Yeah, it was just then, you know, I suppose initially when the kind of shutdown of GA action happened, say before Paddy's weekend, people probably thought at the time it's only going to be a short term. But, you know, the realisation has kind of sunk in for a lot that 2020 is. You know the chances are high that it is a GA season would have to be written off. Um, so I guess it's just interesting to think of the longer serving players. You know how will that kind of affect their decision making um, for 2021? I mean, I was there was an article I was reading a couple of weeks ago. Um, can't remember where it was now, but it was just basically making the point that say the Dublin Mayo game from last August, the, the 2019 All Ireland semi final, that those two squads in particular, which have come to kind of define the last game of the football decade with, with all their games. It's kind of unlikely. Like, there's only maybe a couple of players like Bernard Brogan, Onagar, and Andy Moore have retired since then. But like, say they they won't meet against the 2021. You'd have to think the makeup of the sides are going to be very very different, you know. And it's just, I mean, it's it's just a difficult decision for a lot of guys. I mean, I suppose it depends on what's going on off the pitch for them, um, injuries and that kind of stuff. But you just wonder which way will it go for them? This kind of bout of inactivity, will they kind of decide? Look, that's it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll just bow out now, and it'd probably be a very strange circumstances for them to bow out. Uh, you know, when they think that, you know, usually some guys make the decision straight after a championship match in their own head, you know, that's it, I'm gone. You know, the guys that kind of make it in the dead of winter probably have an idea when a campaign ends that they're probably going to finish up some making in the dressing room. But there is that sense of finality to it, isn't it, that you're wrapping up an intercounty career. This would probably be one of the strangest kind of circumstances for a lot of them to, to try and finish up, um, if that's the, the decision that they arrive at. Mm. Like, uh, I remember age 33, so that's a few years ago now. I decided that I was going to retire from GA and go off traveling for a while. So I went away for three or four months and I ultimately came back and stayed playing. And then that's when we started to win a few medals. But that time that I was away, so I went from age 33, I'm going to retire, to now a few years on, I still don't know when I'm going to retire. And it's possibly down to that same thing of getting a taster of it. Uh, Michael Verney, any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, just disappointed that I did, you didn't release a statement, be it through the GPA or through the Club, uh, uh, Club Players Association at the time. Um, yeah, no, listen, the likes of, we'll, we'll say, you know, Stephen Cluxton, who was rehabbing and would have only been coming back in March and April. Like, it, it maybe, like, I'm not saying he was even thinking about retirement, but it does buy a lot of lads a lot of time to, we'll say, rest the bodies, go off and do some yoga, Pilates, get your body back in shape, rehab injuries, lads that were playing games to game. Uh, week on week throughout the league maybe and their bodies were tired it's a chance chance to recharge and regenerate maybe they'll all be able to go again the fact like you know like people talk about when they retire um and you know missing the training session missing the contact missing people missing everything like they're missing that now fair enough they're doing zoom sessions and different things like that but they're missing that now and they're getting a fair taster of what retirement is like there's a lot of people who really struggle with retirement particularly in the GA you know in any code really and like if you were thinking about it but you can get your body back in good shape during this time I'd imagine it would put those thoughts on the back burner and I'd imagine there are very few uh, lads or ladies that want to be retired because of a pandemic they'll want to retire everybody wants to retire um, on basically on their own behalf so they don't want to be retired by an injury and they won't want to be retired by this either so I, I'd be surprised if there's many, if there's like just say if we don't see a championship this year, I'd be surprised if many step away. Even even though it's an extra year, and we've talked about this Shane, in another show, you're I'm not going to reveal your age live to the, to the national audience, but I'm I'm 33 anyway, and every year is another every year is another year. It's probably another year where the legs get a bit slower and you get more aches and pains. And like I'm thinking 2020, yeah, I'm tunnel vision for 2020. Now maybe it's 2021, but I'm still thinking in my head. While I might slow down, I'll just change and I'll just adapt and try and push it forward for another year and get another year or two. I'm sure there's a lot of people in that situation as well. Kieran Fitzgerald, it was interesting to see nothing to do with COVID due to his retirement from club action. He just had the best innings of all time. And I'd say he realised now was as good a time to go as ever, particularly in the position he was playing in. But uh, it will affect different lads in I saw, I saw a tweet from Darren O'Sullivan, actually, and, and he kind of summed it up nicely. He said, this was going to be my last year playing football. 
but seeing what life is like without uh, sport, I don't think I'll ever retire. Whether you want me or not, uh, Glen Carr, uh, Glen Bay, uh, Glen Carr, you're stuck with me. Have you have you seen this with other players so far, Finton? Yeah, like I, I think it's it's probably getting to the time of year. You said Darren's case there in Kerry. April would have been a big month, you know, it's kind of the club championship one, they kind of run it all off. And then I suppose like a lot of club players, they kind of face into kind of a long, idle summer, depending on how the county gets on. But this is kind of a different type of inactivity, isn't it? That, you know, it's a complete shutdown. Um, you don't even have kind of a couple of league games to kind of keep yourself taking over. So it's, there's a lot of club players kind of around the country that are in, a, in the same boat uh, as him. So I think I kind of see what Michael's saying as well, that you'd say a lot of club players might, who might have been maybe on the fence, you can see them kind of redoubling their efforts and kind of intentions uh, with extra in mind. The Adagabi situation then is kind of different because I suppose it's just, it's a further year on for some of the older kind of stagers and will they kind of want to go again? Um, the other kind of, I suppose, player I was kind of thinking of was, there was a good few kind of GA players this year decided to adopt there to go traveling. So you've seen situations like say, Guy Glennon has talked about it, that he's obviously postponed his traveling plans. Um, Michael Quinlan and Tipperary, he came home in the, in the middle of this kind of at the end of March. So. I suppose you know it's 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 an actual thing for a lot of guys uh, these days to kind of want to get away after giving a good few years to the county um, and a lot of kind of service. But you wonder then, like it's, there's probably no real real answer to this. Like you know, but will they will they think they're going away again next year? Will they kind of not be involved? Um, all these kind of outside factors. Managers is probably the other one, isn't it? That like we often going to hear about the kind of effort the players put in at the end of county. You know, training sessions and matches and all that. But then you hear that a manager could do you know, it. I suppose calls and kind of preparation that he has to make for say one single training session. You know, there's different guys who started. This was their first year as intercounty managers, but then there's others who are probably coming to the end of their terms. Um, you know, depending on what's going on, they're kind of working family life. Whether they have the appetite uh, to kind of go again in 2021, um, if if that's the kind of next proper kind of full season that we're looking at. Mm, absolutely, uh, Michael Verney. A second clue there for the who am I maybe. Yeah, no bother at all. A second clue. Um, I won my sole All Star the year after I won my sole All Ireland Senior Football Championship medal. That's so. What I so won, I won my sole All Star the year after I won my sole All Ireland Senior Football Championship county medal. So again, now what are you what are you thinking, Fintan? Getting any closer? I'm not great now off the top uh, of my head for these things. No, I'm not so sure now. What I was thinking with the dairy angle. Um, uh, Armagh yeah. is there anyone that in Armagh that could have done it and yeah. obviously the viewers out there please get your comments in if you have an idea or an inkling uh, throw it out there and uh, Michael Verney's keeping an eye on the comments there so he'll be able to update us if there's anything um, I suppose at the moment we're kind of we're, uh, we're hitting a blank there so we'll move on to the next section which is things that no longer exist in, in the GEA and I suppose when we're looking at all these classic games that are on TV at the moment you're kind of reminded of them and um, I, I really enjoy seeing the line balls in both hurling and football and um, anyone who's watched Kerry Offley All-Ireland from 1982 will have seen it where the linesman places the ball on the ground and you cannot disturb it, move it, place it uh, sit it up on top of the grass or anything. You just have to strike it where it is. Has anything else stood out to you guys? Uh, I'll, I'll start off with you, Michael. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, the couple of things I always liked, like the long sleeve jerseys. Remember wearing long sleeve jerseys back in the day, particularly you know January, February, March, and you just don't really see them anymore. Lads are wearing Under Armour underneath the tight fit kind of jerseys. That would be one that sticks out. Then there was like the famous, and thank God they're not around anymore. Remember those cardboard kind of shorts that were like, like any bit of whiteness you had up around the top of your legs, it definitely showed them off. They were the most unflattering things of all time. They were absolutely awful. It's kind of, I'd always think like probably mid to late 90s would be that. And then it's like almost revolutionary. The silk shorts came in and you're like, why didn't we have these 10 years ago like? But there, they will be two that stand out anyway, just off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah, I seem to remember uh, one of the All Irelands in the eighties, and Connor Hayes playing full back for Galway. He obviously had that ridiculous sort of half bicycle helmet looking thing with no face guard. But he also, um, I th though some of those shorts were barely legal. Like they were bet up inside a man. You could make out the full shape of a man. They were uh, they were fairly racy and barely legal, Fintan. Yeah, sorry, Warren. Like the, the thing you're saying about Conor Hayes as well, the kind of the different hurling elements has kind of stood out, hasn't it? With some of the games that have been kind of shown, uh, like a couple of the '90s games, um, 
with Timmy McCarthy's one was kind of kind of stood out for in, in the Cork attack with the kind of the white helmet that he had, Cormac Bonner. Uh, there was a guy who came on. It was a couple of weeks ago. Claire Galway was on ninety five. Uh, I can't remember his name now. We got a big, massive red helmet. He came on for Galway in the second half. I think it was similar to the one that is it Christy Heffernan of Kilkenny used to kind of wear that kind of uh, the astronaut kind of box one of yeah. them. Yeah, I had um, one of those astronaut ones, one of the, the square ones with the flat top. I remember playing the Parish League game when I must have been, I don't know, 10 or even younger years of age. And the rain was gathering on the top of it and every so often it would just spill down over your face completely. It was an absolute horror show. And I got the space helmet then, the big round one after. Um, anything else that's, uh, that's from bygone days that we don't see in GA anymore? Yeah, no, I, yeah, no I, I, there's a couple of things like I would definitely think like, like ground hurling is the one. Like I've looked back at some of the classic games, and like if my own county, Offaly is probably the county that's probably most synonymous with ground hurling. And like it's just totally alien. You look at, I even look back at the 2004 Leinster final, the last Leinster final Offaly were in, and there was a mighty lot of ground hurling in it. And it's just you wouldn't even think of doing it now. Like if you did that in training, I've often you'd often been pulling a ball, particularly as a back, or even flick a ball, and lads would be like, just take the ball in your hand, take the ball in your hand. Um, whereas like when we played with, under Joe Dooley even uh, less than 10, 10 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, we would have done lines of four, the length of the field, kind of ground hurling. Because it would have been just traditional to what we had done. And you would have seen other teams doing it now. And like it's, it's that rare now that if someone does it, it's like, geez, it's rare you see a ground stroke anymore. The only time you'd see it is if the ball drops around the goals and a lad is pulling on a goal, which I think is still one of the most effective ways to get a goal is a first-time strike anywhere from anywhere from inside the 13 I would say uh, that and overhead pulling uh, you, do, you don't see it half as much it's funny how the rules of hurling have changed almost like uh, there's a great hurler uh, from Burr Liam Power he was part of the four All-Ireland winning teams and he famously broke all four of his hurls in the 2003 All-Ireland club final against Dunleigh he had them all broke after 35 minutes just with overhead pulling whereas now almost if you if you hear the ash break and it's almost like a free or it's you know what I mean it's still totally legal but it, you just don't see it half as much now particularly lads are trying to clean catch the whole time there'd be another two that would definitely stand yeah, out yeah because like these days you'd only probably go for the high pull on a on a puck out or something like that if you wanted to sort of mark your man's card and let him know you're not just going to be able to come up here and compete for for every ball with the clean for a clean catch uh, I'm going to give you something else to think about but Finton. You did a piece with Pat Mulcahy talking about Newtown Chandram and, you know, referencing the O'Connor twins, Ben and Jerry, uh, recently on the 42. And what struck me was that that was a time when people were giving out about the running game, but giving out about that particular style of play, it's kind of moved on a little bit. It's more giving out about sweepers these days than that particular type of play. Yeah, he, he was interesting to chat it because he came from, like, he would have played in the mid 90s, like he would have won a county senior medal with a uh, division outfit in Cork Avenue, and then he played up until the mid 90s with Cork, so, and he's kind of involved in coaching now, so he's kind of seen the way the kind of game has evolved, you know, and he basically said it was the O'Connor's father that kind of introduced it to them, you know, the kid's attitude was that if a ball was hit into a, f- a guy in the full forward lane, the, f- the guy in the full forward lane was always blamed for not winning the ball. Um, so it was the personnel that was at fault. Whereas if you know, say you hand pass it to a guy next to you, and the ball move breaks down, it's a style that is at fault. And look, you've all heard it. You've all heard it over the years. You know, the shout leave it in. You know, teams are are tippy tappy is another phrase that's used a lot. Uh, teams are kind of playing short passing around the middle, but it's just how much. Like Michael reference again there, or Kev Offley's been hurting there. Like so, it was Claire Offley was on a couple of weeks ago in '95, and just couldn't get over. I mean, I know it's 20, 25 years ago now, but the amount of times guys will get the ball and, you know, you're just so conditioned to seeing a guy around the middle look for a teammate, whereas it's just that wasn't the kind of way it was then, you know. And that probably feeds into how low scoring it was. When you look back, I mean, the scoring was, I think it was, was it 113 to 28 to finish. I mean, that's that's kind of the score after about 25, 30 minutes now in uh, in some games. Um, but kind of Pat was kind of just basically saying it was completely logical to him what he was being caught kind of around that time around 2000. But like now he's involved with his club and now he sees like if, if you're not doing that now as he puts it you're not playing hurling and it's just how much it's kind of evolved and how kind of changed over the years and, and kind of looking at some of those old games that they've shown over the last while has kind of shown that um there was one clip i did see was the clear goal in 85 semi-final one of the clear goals was actually a really nice kind of a support play move which ended with sparrow lachlan uh, pulling the ball into the net but it was kind of one of the rare ones that i've seen over the last while in any of the games that have popped up that uh, it kind of maybe resembles the way hurling uh, is played now. Mm. I find it very difficult to listen to Pep Guardiola at the best of times. 
the way he goes on, a bit pompous. But uh, his, his kind of term about, I don't pass to move the ball, I pass to move the opposition. So that's, you'd imagine, the way it's, it's moving in GEA as well, that teams aren't just lumping it up the field and trying to get it up there as quick as possible. You're obviously trying to create those spaces and those pockets. So another thing, and, and you can react on that in a second, Michael Verney, but another thing that, that has disappeared from GEA is like the really, really olden days. Now, this is even before your hand-pass goals and hand-pass points and hurling and stuff like that. But the Archbishop throwing the ball in in the middle of the field, or even predating that, and also including the Archbishop, you had that situation where both teams had to line up, and it was more or less everyone in the middle of the field, I think, for the throw-in, but certainly all 15 players would be on either side of the field, a bit like soccer. So, uh, Michael Verney, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, just on that one, that's a funny one, because we played, uh, who did we play? We played Waterford IT in a Fitzgibbon semi-final down in Dangham one year, and Bonner was over Waterford. And it's happened a couple of times, the odd time at Inter-County, Davey's done it a couple of times, where he's just had all six forwards lined up along the 65 at the start for throwing, which is obviously not the, the 14 or 15 lads back in the day. But it's something kind of completely alien. It's something that you wouldn't see too often. The one with the Archbishop, I, I think that's brilliant. I, I, lo I love stuff like that. Because it's stuff like that that you look back on. It just shows how much things have changed as well. Um, another thing I was just looking back on the 95 on Ireland. You know, like if we didn't have them and we don't have them anymore, that the great halftime interviews with the manager or the selector or the player that may be injured or something like that, we'd have never got the, as much as I hate to say it, we I've never got the jerk up, Nan. You know, we're going to do it. You know, that was one of the most iconic lines coming out for the second half of the off, actually, a couple of years ago, actually, it might have even been 2019. Um, I was doing the sideline reporter for Airsport, who were doing the live GA games in April. And I think it was, yeah, it was Nafina against St. Vincent's. And at half time, I got um, Mick Deegan who was part of the management team for Nafina. So I was able to do that halftime interview with him, and it was kind of funny. I said, so uh, what are you going to do in the second half? I mean, there were a couple of points behind or whatever, and he says, well, I've told the lads to just run at Ger Brennan. His legs are gone. And he said <laughs> this live on TV. It was absolutely hilarious. <laughs> But see, this is the thing, Shane, um, and the more than our job as journalists or whatever, the best stuff you get is immediately after a match, invariably, or the best stuff you get is just, like, things are so fresh in his head, he's going to say what he thinks, he's not going to be like, oh, we're going to stick to the plan or stick to the process, he's like, he's going to say what immediately kind of comes to mind, I used to love those interviews, I used to love, like, the old-fashioned, I love look back at the Cork Offaly 2000, just apologise to Finton here, I look back at the Cork Offaly 2000 All-Ireland semi-final and it was like an interview with Johnny Dooley, Offaly captain, Jur Oakley with the jersey off, with just the bare chest out like that on the field after, Simon Wheeler and uh, an interview with Pat Flory, all on the pitch after and it's it's great, but like the, you mightn't get a load of quotable stuff but you get a lot of emotion and I, something like that, I don't see a reason why we couldn't bring kind of stuff like that back a bit. Bit more. I know players are sanitised a bit more. But I used to love that. And even just something else that's missing, like Tip won the All Ireland. I hate we're talking about Tip winning All Ireland, obviously. But when Tip won the All Ireland in in one, the presentation was on the pitch. Do you know just different things that have happened, different things that have been moved um, throughout the years? And we were talking about tactics there. Like Cyril Farrell was kind of the first one to bring in the third man midfielder, it's like late eighties, early nineties. And it's just amazing that kind of tactic is nearly gone out of the game now. And like a two-man full forward line is nearly a given. So in 30 years, it'll just show you how kind of much things Finn, have changed. Did you make a pre presentation on the field? Um, like, because you would have had it with Mark Landers also in the centre of the field. It just felt so dislocated from the celebrations. Yeah, I, th I think it was at 90, 99, 98, sorry, was it when Galway won his kind of, uh, they had been doing the open stand. Uh, was it 02 or 03 was the next one? Um, I think it was, yeah. There, there was actually a piece, uh, College Nate Farrell in 42 did with the 2000 football final at the week or last week, and Aidan McGowan was talking about that. But <clears throat> the 2000 football final replay, first of all, it's kind of a thing the I take for granted now, but there was a big thing at the time we were playing the replay on a Saturday. You know, this was almost sacrilegious, it was early October because there were so few replays, and obviously, there's been so many over the last while that we've been kind of so used to it all in the finals. And then he said the kind of surreal nature of it was kind of compounded by the fact. Uh, that the presentation took place on the pitch. You were looking at the Hogan Sand, which was being done up at the time. Um, just very kind of surreal for players when I suppose they would, that carry team with a few years before in 87 have had, you know, pitch invasion was still a thing and subsequently afterwards. Um, and now obviously they're able to, they're, I suppose, you know, they, they still get to go around to the fans afterwards. But he just said, yeah, it was just kind of very, very kind of a surreal, kind of an odd way to kind of finish the season. Um, 
but at the same time, I mean, that was say you're talking to Mark Landers one ninety nine. It was the same for Kilkenny two thousand Tip oh one. Those were big wins for those kind of the big three, the early aristocrats. I don't think those players, given the way it had gone, the nineties had gone for them. They kind of out the line. I probably cared too much at that time. Uh, where, where they got the cup and where it was presented to them, as long as they uh, they got over the line finally. Yeah, and and people don't don't forget to get your comments in there. Michael Burney's keeping an eye on him. But like for you, Finton, like when you look at the way soccer, it's so commonplace to have the celebrations in the in the center of the field, and maybe they kind of they've kind of tailored their celebrations to that, like bringing a big stage into the middle and having like confetti or fireworks going off be, around them. And you'd see the same in the Heineken Cup over the years. Maybe it's just that it looked wrong in in the GA because it was like this small little platform in the middle. And it was just, it kind of just lacked, I don't know, just the colour and the pizzazz that the occasion probably demanded. Maybe I'm wrong though, but that's just how I felt. It just didn't feel like this was a big moment. No, I, I think one of the issues is that the biggest prize in the GA obviously is based on the same stadium. So if you think about soccer, you know, between Champions League final, World Cup final, or Euros Championship, it's, it's in different venues. But because Crow Park is the big one, the steps of the Hogan has this kind of mythical kind of phrase to it, you know? Um, and different players have kind of talked about it that like you know their big thing is to kind of not be delayed uh, I suppose back in the days of kind of pitch invasions to kind of get up there in time for the cup to be kind of presented now at least they know that they're going to be there but you know even for players as captains and all that to just kind of to get up there and to kind of look around the stadium you know I, I think that's why it has kind of such a special place um, for GA fans I'm sure it's the same for you think of Munster Hurling Thurless Ulster Football Clonus that kind of view from particular stands um, where we kind of associate trophies being handed out and I think that's I mean like I'm trying to think of a soccer club and maybe maybe Wembley in the FA Cup kind of sense like you know but I, I think it just kind of means so much to to the player the captain who gets to kind of accept the trophy and his kind of teammates to be looking up at him but that's why I think the kind of presentation of the stand holds such a, a special place and maybe why those you know that kind of period when Cup was being developed it just kind of looks so odd uh, the copy presented on the pitch. Yeah, Michael Verney, you'll you'll be hoping someday that uh, Offaly can lift lift the Christie Ring Cup. But would you rather it up the up in the stands? Right. If you wanna if you wanna lower the blade, we can lower the blade. There's absolutely no issue. Um, just a couple of a couple of things in on social media, Shane. Um, Niall Carty, I actually loved this because I used to think the effect of it on the screen was unreal. He said, "Bring back." The crest painted on the pitch on All Ireland final day. Oh, I used to love that. The ball would almost get lost in it. And even times there was times that like if you if you fell or anything in it, you could your jersey can could end up with bits of paint on it and stuff like that. I used to love that. Um, we have a couple of comments in on social media there as well. We have a couple of correct answers to our Who Am I uh, as well. And just John Butler on uh, on Twitter. John Butler actually uh, a bar man. He said about what do I miss from the GA passing around. Passing around the boot cog spanner around the dressing room. I remember, remember those days, and you know it was it was never a uniform uh, boot kind of cog. It was a different type of one for a different type of boot. So you could have an Adidas one, and if you had a Nike boot cog, it wouldn't work. All this kind of crack. Uh, Philip Lanigan from the Mail actually came up with a good one. What do you miss most from the GA? And he just said games question mark, which is a fair point uh, in the in the current situation. That really um, at the what moment. about the remember when everyone used to wear blades? instead of cogs or long studs or whatever, they'd wear blades. Have they gone all together? I mean, Finton, when did you when did you last even boot up? I'm not even sure. Jeez, that's a good question. And uh, I suppose, give, given the lack of games, when are we going to get a chance to do, it, do anything like, like that again? Um, but I suppose, as well, that, that kind of goes back as well, like what Mike said there, like you'd imagine like everything's so kind of drilled down now in terms of team levels of preparation that, you know, everything's kind of prepared for them and all that. Like, you know, there's no, none of this kind of scrambling around. You know, you talk about boot keys, but you know, different types of gear or whatever like you know someone forgets their socks or anything like that like you know just it's all uh it's all kind of laid on for them now like there's none of that kind of thing of having to, to be, well at the, at the top level of kind of inter-county when you hear kind of players talk with the stories and how you know the kit man is getting thanks uh from the top of the the top of the hogan stand or, or wherever you know it's been such an essential part of the, the team setup uh michael uh, you have a big smirk on your face go on go on no, just, no just if it was talking about boots and stuff there uh Parik Horn was over our school team in St. Brendan's in Burr and uh, Brian Watkins from my own club, one of the best club hurlers in Offaly the last 10 or 15 years. He's on the Offaly panel at the moment. Uh, 
we went down to Flannan's one day and uh, Walkie would be very laid back about things and we like he went we went the whole way down to Ennis and he never said a word or anything like that. He didn't have any boots on him or anything like that. So he was quietly going around the dressing room of Flannan's. Imagine this, like a whole day off school, went down to Flannan's and he's quietly going around the dressing room <laughs> looking for boots. And Parry Corn got wind of it, absolutely effed him out of it. And he just ended up, he had to sit on the line for the day. But like, it was co- it was commonplace, like, that he'd look for, he'd get a helmet in the dressing room five minutes before a championship match back in those days. It's just amazing, kind of, how things have changed. In, in a way, in a way, it's great. In a way, it's kind of a bit sad because they're all the great stories. If you talk about some of the great GA stories now, it's like junior football, junior hurling, where, you know, there's a big lad with a knee brace or where there's a big full forward. You know, it's kind of those, that's what you, like, I'd say, if you go to a junior match now, it's so they're still so enjoyable. All the like there's lads dying, there's lads maybe around the beer the night before. You know, it's just all that stuff has kind of gone so maybe PC now that maybe you don't get as many good stories. There's still plenty of them out there. You just need to kind Number of find one, them. You I know? forgot my boots for the All Ireland Club final, so I can't give out that much. A couple of others. Where are you going to bring that up? Yeah, well, I might as well get me. Uh, I might as well admit it rather than let you lord play it on me. Another thing, DP. That was a big thing there one time, and Tiger Band, that was another thing you'd use to warm up the, the hands maybe. And another thing, do you remember the woolly grips you used to have on the hurlies? It's obviously all the, the more smoother ones now, and they're very cushioned. But they were, they were very woolly, and there'd be tassels coming off them all over the place. Yeah, the towel Yeah, the towel grip, the good old towel grip back in the day. Like, uh, But like once the towel got wet, it was useless. It was you might as well not have a grip on the hurl at all. So it's one of those amazing kind of things. Absolute know? waste of time. But you know what, Michael? Um, you said somebody got the answer right. Do you want to throw the last two uh, quiz clues at myself and uh, Finton there and see who gets it first? Yeah, we still only I still only have one person on social media, and one of my friends is after texting me with the answer. So we'll still drag out the next two. The third the third clue is my first year playing inter county football. Was the year I won? The year I won my only All Ireland, and my county won their only All Ireland. That was my first year playing inter county football. I'm no closer, Finton. No. Yeah. All right. Well, look, sure. We'll uh, we'll admit a small bit of defeat just for now. We're going to move on to our next section, which is Winter All Ireland. So, let's say things are moved around, and obviously at the top of the show we talked about Leo Varadkar talking about phasing things back and. GA being partial contact and uh, and uh, the issue we had with that but if let's say we get to a situation like the, the World Cup that's supposed to be in Qatar there's talks of it going into winter if we end up with a winter All-Ireland does that change things does the, do Dublin and Kerry remain the, the teams most likely to win it or all of a sudden does this help out Tyrone we saw Tyrone play against Kerry in terrible weather there a couple of months ago and they eked out a win obviously championship and, and league are very different anyway just in terms of how dialed in you are for victory in terms of putting everything into it but would the conditions alone sort of turn things back towards someone like Tyrone who of course also beat Dublin in terrible weather Finton I'll start off with you well actually one of the biggest things I was thinking wouldn't be the, the conditions would be preparation so say for example a lot of teams of students and teachers I mean if it's a winter all Ireland you imagine it's going to be far more difficult in terms of kind of training and all that I mean and Kerry talked with this a lot that Obviously, it's one of the issues, you know, economically and all that, that a lot of people kind of move outside the county for work and for college. So, like, if you're Peter King's kind of prepare team in November, December, imagine it's going to be a lot more difficult, isn't it? Because more guys are going to be based outside the county, whether it's in college or Cork or Limerick, or, and then obviously, you know, teachers won't be off. Um, so, I mean, would that work in kind of Dublin's favour? Um, like, the other thing I think as well is that what was the kind of question mark we were putting over Dublin this year was maybe a new manager appointed late, the difficulty in kind of betting in, uh, being on the go a long time, last was all Ireland went to a replay, and a lot of kind of miles on the clock. I think this, you know, if, if it does come back again in kind of September, October, I think they're going to be very, very fresh. I think Desi Farrell will kind of have time to maybe kind of plan and, and do different things. So I could see it kind of working in their favour. Michael? Yeah, just on Desi, what Finton says there would be very, very interesting um, because. If it does come back, just saying we have eight to ten weeks of club action, it will be interesting for a really elite, elite county like that, that particularly has so much at stake, whether those players will just be in contact with their club at that time or whether there will be county going on as well or whether there will be some something put in place to make sure that they can't do that. 
Um, I think that's quite important too because otherwise it could undermine the club. So it'll be interesting to see, like, I know in a, a Kilkenny situation, we're just saying hurling, Cody's not going to interfere with the club, but possibly in football, some of the clubs could be interfered with. Particularly, I'm, I'm not, Dublin would be one that would that would come, come in my head, to be honest with you. Um, you mentioned Tyrone. Uh, it's, the, it's going to be a different type of football-ish, kind of. If the games are playing in Crow Park, there will still be a certain type of a game. Yes, conditions won't be... It could be raining or it could be freezing or something like that. But in general, the pitch is still going to play to a very, very high level. It's not the same as playing in Parnell Park in November or December. It's still going to be... The conditions are still going to be good. But Tyrone are one of those teams that seem to... I don't know. It's just, the, I suppose, the ferocity they're tackling, just how physical they are, how fit they are as well. Um, and just with the handling is tougher in winter, things like that. They're just able to kind of grind you down a bit more. They'd definitely be one of the teams that will benefit. Uh, interesting to hear what Finton said about, about Desi Farrell as well. While it's not contact time as we know it, it's not contact time on the field, we'll never know. But I'd love to know what they're doing behind the scenes. Up there, the standard bearers, when it comes in terms of preparation, I'd love to know what they're doing now. Because chances are, given what they've done over the last, the goods of the last decade, what they're doing now is probably superseding what everybody else is doing. It's probably on a different level again. I would say that there'd be fair public backlash with what Michael's saying there. If you've club championship match going on in August, September, and some county manager, you know, pulls his players and that they're not allowed to be club training, like, you know, I, I could imagine that will go down very, very badly, uh, given everything that's going on now. So that would be kind of a, an issue for the GA. If Club GA comes back first, that it's actually kind of preserved and maybe kind of ring fenced for that. Who who do you, who would you like to see do um, push back on that? Let's say it happens that County Manager X does that within his county and pulls the players away from the club. Who do you think should be should be kind of calling foul on this and making it a public issue? Is it the GPA? Is it the CPA? Uh, the GA themselves? I mean, who should do it and who who's even going to police it? Because if I was a club team, I'd like to be able to report it to some somewhere centrally that. This is happening and it needs to stop it. Uh, normally, I would say you could, you could argue this. I'd say it is probably going to be a GA issue, isn't it? To kind of and get Cook County boards kind of in charge of it. Now, I know there's been talk in the past about trying to resolve the club county debate, and it's been you know issue that county boards aren't going to want to maybe police this successfully, aren't going to be aren't going to be successful in doing it. But I think these are pretty exceptional circumstances. So, if club champs should come back. For, you know, six to eight weeks first. You know, I think there would have to be some sort of a, I don't know, an agreement. I don't know, you probably can't you know, rate a contract or anything like that. Like, but it's in that, that basically that that has to take precedent, all right? Because I just think that would, I think like it's you know it's it's a tough time for everyone. Like, and I think that would be a seriously kind of a damaging situation if after all of it, you know, it's kind of a, a two fingers to the club game. Uh, when you come back at a time when it's meant to absolutely take precedent. I'd be absolutely shocked if the county managers didn't do this because even the April club month comes in, so this is supposed to be the dawn of everyone is operating off the one hymn sheet here, all managers are going to leave their players alone. But you see that some inter-county teams might finish up their, their league progress a little bit earlier in March, for example. So the club championship might actually start in that particular county at the very end of March and then the county manager will be pushing to have all the club championship fixtures over by the middle of April so that they therefore have the players from mid-April up until the start of their inter-county championship, set, let's say May 10th for Munster Hurling Championship for, as, as an example. And they're actually even still trying to get games called off. I think this is happening across the board. We're not going to name any managers or players, but I'm sure plenty of our, our viewers have seen that as well. Michael, um, I, would you be in the same boat as me thinking that managers are going to be very happy to try and contravene this and push as hard as they can just to get the players back as quick even if it's once a week because even during club championship now managers are still looking for the players a couple of times a week 100% I did a piece on the club month uh, I'm not too sure when it was probably about six months ago and uh, the, the basis of the piece was actually the, the Wicklow Hurling manager Eamon Scallon who made a proposal to the Wicklow County Board. It would have been December, November, December. They won the league. They won the Division 2B league and were beaten, I think, in the group stages of the Christie Ring. And he just said, basically, the club month was totally undermining his preparations for the championship. And basically, he was asking that they abolish the club month in Wicklow. So like, that's Wicklow hurling. And with due respect to Wicklow, and I played with Wicklow for a year and a bit, that's Wicklow hurling. That's not... Tipperary hurling or Dublin football. So if it's happening, it's ha if it's happening at that level, you can be damn sure it's happening at higher levels. Like unless um, 
people with a voice make a big, big issue out of this, I think it's just going to rain free. And I think this is where, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are still unsure of the GPA, what they're about, their interests and stuff. I think if they, if they kind of push this one hard, I think this could be an area. If they grasp that particular nettle, they could get a lot more people on site. Yeah, and, and I think this is an opportunity for them to do that in the sense that I understand what you're saying about club one, but I think it's very difficult to kind of compare it to that from the point of view that you won't have had a situation leading into these club games where a player will have been playing with his county or training with his county for three months. Uh, the fact that this is a chance for meaningful games, you imagine most players would be delighted with that and would be really, really eager for it. Like, you know? um, players would, I mean, I think the manager will still say, I want to work with my players collectively, do a block of training, uh, work on tactics, whatever it will be. Yeah, but given it's going to be kind of a one-off this year and given that the structure could be changed, I mean, I wonder will there be the same pressure on managers to perform? Like, you're, like a lot of it comes back to managers coming in for kind of a short term, maybe eager to make their match under pressure from a county board, you know, get us to promote it or do this in a provincial championship, do that. I mean, you'd think that there will be a bit more allowances this year, wouldn't you? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, there's like a team that goes out in the first round and say, well, it's a football championship, won't be as harshly judged or praised this year as they would in previous years. Mm. Um, Michael, jump in there. Yeah, just I, I, I agree with Fintan. I think it's uh, maybe it's not the best terminology to use, but I do think it's kind of a free pass for managers in some ways. Like, there's always going to be the, ex- the excuses of whoever wins the All Ireland, it would be, Jiz, we, we really used the months off unbelievably well. We did this, this, and this, or we did very little and I kept them fresh. And whoever doesn't succeed would be like, Asher, that was a disaster. How are you supposed to prepare anyway? You know what I mean? So I think it'll be taken like that as a free pass. I would hope that a hard line is told on club players staying with their club. And I think the, the inter-county championships then, there'd be, some, there'd be a fair element of surprise to them then as well. They maybe haven't been getting to do a lot of tactical sessions on the field. Uh, who knows how many weeks they'll have before the championship starts, if it does start. There'll be an element of surprise to it. There'll be mistakes being made, and it could make it even more interesting. The really well polished teams maybe won't be as well polished, and it will make it even more interesting and maybe even more chaotic than it has been yeah, in previous just, years. Uh, I think we're naive if, if we're kind of thinking that county managers aren't going to try and run roughshod over the clubs here. Um, just to get back to the question we had, which is who would win a winter football All Ireland? And generally, it's going to be a team in Division One. That seems to be the way of it in, in football over the years. But uh, the teams in Division One of the league this year, and I'll just go in order of their positions after five games in 2020. So Galway are on top, Kerry, Tyrone, Dublin, Donegal, Monaghan, Mayo, and uh, Meath were in there as well. Finton, if you were to call a winter All Ireland winner, who would it be? I think Dublin. I, I just even like the preparation thing that I mentioned there. I do think that's a massive benefit for them. The majority of their players are based in the county. Um, like. I think I could be wrong saying I think in the winter, kind of in the spring months of the league, I think Kerry could have up to fifteen, for example, based in Cork. There's some working full time, then there's a lot in college. I mean, there, there'd be another consideration for this as well. Say, for example, you end up with a kind of a December All Ireland. A lot of players have college exams. It could be a pretty tricky time for them in terms of, you know, trying to train for an All Ireland final and then like you're back to and, and back, back to kind of normal kind of college college exams and that. Like you know, so it it just could be a lot kind of trickier for some counties than others. And I suppose. I mentioned Dublin and Kerry because I think it's by common consensus before all this happened they were like Dublin obviously the, the at the front of the pack and Kerry kind of best place to place the challenge and May will obviously be another county as well that will be badly affected by that kind of travel thing you'd imagine having to play in winter I mean you see it every spring they all talk about the difficulties they have preparing during the league uh, uh, because only their players are based inside the county and then during James Horne's first spell especially things got back together when they were all kind of back in Mayo for the summer when the students were home um, Look, obviously different circumstances and you know it's going to be kind of a shorter period of time so they might be able to kind of work something out to kind of suit themselves but yeah I, I, I don't think you can kind of go against Dublin at this one whether it's a, a winter, spring, summer or autumn all learning at the moment. Yeah and even Nicky Brennan, former GA president, former Kilkenny player and manager, he was uh, he suffered recently with uh, COVID-19 had a, had a tough old time but, but uh, thankfully he's getting a bit better but he talked about the minimal chances of Intercounty coming back and then you even think of how many players are going to opt out for a period of time. Now, we don't know what will happen in terms of like uh, breakthroughs, antivirals, whatever it might be. So, But there might be a certain amount of players that opt out. And if a couple of core guys opt out of any team, they could potentially go from being a contender to being out of the picture. But um, otherwise, uh, Michael Verney, who do you think uh, is most likely to win this All-Ireland in winter? 
again, just what you said there, like Dublin could afford to have somebody to opt out. You know, some of the, the, the like the Monhans couldn't afford to have, you know, a Carl O'Connell or a Niall Kearns or someone like that opt, opt out. So chances are the team that has the greater strength in debt, the Dublins of this world, are probably still going to be favoured in that sort of a scenario. I think so. I think a team like a Monaghan could go well, though. Uh, a team that it's kind of very together and capable of beating anyone in a once-off type of game. I think uh, a knockout format could suit someone like them. And I just think, wouldn't it be unbelievable to be celebrating in All-Ireland at Christmas time? Jeez, it'd be unbelievable. Um, we'll get your thoughts. I'm going to go with Dublin myself. I just think too much strength in that power physically. I think they'll bully most teams at any time of the year, and I don't see that changing too much. Um, your final clue then for the Who Am I? Yeah, just a couple little quick social media things coming in there Brian Brophy we were talking about things you're missing the GA putting your child over the turnstiles like literally that will resonate with probably three quarters of the Irish population I would say whether it was a father or a mother lifting you over the turnstile or you were the one actually you know or you were the one that has done it yourself it's um that's kind of so commonplace uh, in the GA or was so commonplace my final clue is and this should help this should help you out here is uh, my nick my nicknames include JCB and God. Well, I look. I'm going to have to fess up. Uh, I checked Twitter there and I saw someone putting up the answer, so I'm not going to say the answer. Uh, Finton, give you a last chance. I don't there. Know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think the answer on Twitter, the answer on Twitter is okay, not so the right answer. So the answer I saw put up by Shane Brophy uh, of the Nina Guardian was Ronan Clark of Armagh. Is that not correct? That is incorrect. Right, that's the cat among the pigeons again. Uh, who's got the nickname God? Owen Kelly had it anyway for tip. Anyone else spring to mind, Fintan? No, Clark was the one that I was thinking of when you had said uh, our master doesn't two player there mm. earlier. Um, JCB is the better clue, lads. So you're talking about a big pig of a man then, obviously. JCB. Jeez, there's probably people screaming at us thinking how stupid we are here, Fintan. Uh, no, no, uh, Noel Gallagher has it on Twitter here. A good mate of mine. He's living over in Abu Dhabi at the moment. He has it. Um, will I reveal all? Go for it. The one and only Francie Bellew. That's that's poor from us. That is very yeah. poor. I didn't realise he had the nickname God. That's, yeah, that's, ah, come on. Yeah, ah, come on. Yeah, that's like true. I, I, I would, not, would not have got that. I didn't know that he had a nickname, to be honest. Yeah. Actually, one other um, thing that springs to mind is people selling ice creams at matches. Uh, club championship, I remember McDonough Park and Nina growing up, a lad going around with like the cardboard box of ice creams over his shoulder roaring, ice is ice is, get your ices. That sort of thing had to be happening. <laughs> imagine, that, imagine, that, imagine that was said now. Get, uh, ice is ice is, get your ices. Jail. Mac to be people running out of the ground. Absolutely. All right, lads. Uh, I think that's it for today. So appreciate you joining me, Michael Verney of the Irish Independent and Fintan O'Toole of the Forty Two. We chat again. I'm sure, lads. All the best and chat soon. Thanks, Michael.